guys, welcome back to my channel for another episode of Porn Star Confessions. Today I'm super excited because I've got the one, the only, the legendary Lance Charger. So welcome, Lance. Hey everybody, how are you? So look geez, like you just have such an impressive resume. Let's let's start at the beginning. Okay. So, I mean, one thing I, I like to talk about on this channel is because, you know, people, when they think porn star, they think, like, drug addict, alcoholic, yeah. train wreck. They just think nothing positive. And if anything, you disprove a lot of those stereotypes. She so graduated from UC Berkeley, right? Uh, UC Santa Barbara, yeah. I mean, that's not an easy school to get into. I mean, that's impressive. No, they didn't actually accept me the first time I applied. And so I, and it was the only school I applied to because they were the only ones that, that I wanted to go to that had an international relations sort of emphasis on the political science major. And uh, so they said no. And then I wrote them another letter with all the things that I thought they missed and why they should admit me. And, uh, and then they admitted me at the last minute. I got accepted about three weeks before school started. It was crazy. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was a concert musician back then. I played violin, viola, and cello. So I had this whole history of like being first chair of California state honor orchestra and traveling around the state, missing high school because I was representing the school playing viola. Um, and I like sang and danced back then. And I was in like the lead in a bunch of plays and stuff. So I just really leaned into the arts piece. Um, and, you know, my explanation was that I'll bring something to the campus and to the major, which is political science. I did a couple of emphases. I did international relations and global peace and security. So I kind of did this, I leaned into this whole pitch that I would bring a unique point of view to the major and to the culture there. Um, and they let me in. It was kind of by the skin of my teeth, but I, I told my parents, if, if I don't go there, I'm not going anywhere. So I was prepared not to go to college that year. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a breath that way. So were you always <laughs> into performing? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I was, well, I don't know, maybe, I mean, now that you say that I'm remembering, me and all the girls in the neighborhood when I was a little kid having like roller skating shows for all the neighbors but, <laughs> to like funky town. And <laughs> so maybe, um, but like somebody picked me um, when I was in third grade, the music teacher was kind of watching me in the audience in elementary school. And I guess she came up to me and said, I really think you should play the violin. And I was, I was so little, I was like, I don't even know what that means. And I don't know, she pitched me. I don't remember what she said, but I ran home and told my parents it's what I wanted to do. And my parents, being my parents, of course, said, okay. And then my mom had to run out and find the best violin and get me all set up. And I played for from the time I was in third grade until about two years after I went to college. So about 21. Um, but then, ironically, and this is a crazy story, I, I, I was really struggling with my sexuality. I had... Um, been with girls in high school, I kind of started sleeping with girls to sort of change the perception that, that people had of me in school. Um, and, you know, like had a cheerleader cheat on me when she was dating a football player and almost got my ass kicked. I couldn't even show up for my own graduation because the football players were all going to like beat the shit out of me. So, uh, uh, but it was better than being called a faggot all the time. Right. So when I went to school, I realized I needed to figure out the difference between, I called them Mike and Michael, right? Because I always went by Michael when I was younger. So I was like, how do I reconcile? Because I really like this Mike guy. And I feel I like he's cool and I feel confident and comfortable in his skin, but I don't want to lose the performative part and the sensitivity and the compassion and all these sort of sensitive sides. I, I saw them as very different people. Um, and when I went to college, I that second year, third year, I quit playing because I thought I was scared of my sexuality and I thought the music was making me gay. Oh my God. So I started trying to like lean out of anything that was, I tried to like lean out of anything that was that performative part because I thought the arts were what was sort of, and you know, and then like 
six months after I did that, I met my first boyfriend and realized, yeah, I'm never going back. So this is definitely for me. <laughs> but it was uh, it was an interesting time. So I I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for your generation, especially you know what you guys dealt with as far as coming out and everything else, because it was a lot different for you back then. But I'm wondering, oh, yeah. you personally, what where was the struggle like? Because it doesn't sound like it really came from your parents. No, nothing. You know, it's funny, though. My parents to this day swear that they had no idea, um, which I still find shocking because I see pictures of myself when I was a kid and I talk to friends that I grew up with as a kid and they're like, oh, girl. So it's like, um, but I think maybe when they started wondering, I started dating girls. Um, and I mean, I snuck into a girlfriend's house, climbed up the side of her house, was fucking her. Her dad was listening outside the door because he saw me climb up the house. He waited till we finished, kicked the door down. I had kind of long blonde hair, grabbed me by my hair naked and threw me down their stairs and called my dad and said he was taking me and my girlfriend to Mexico because we were getting married because she was clearly pregnant because he just caught us fucking. So my dad had to like come down at four in the morning and I'm, I'm like 16 come down at four in the morning and talk, talk my, you know, talk, talk the guy down and get me out of the house. And so, you know, they lived through a lot of that kind of stuff with me. So I think when I came out at 21, uh, they were both like, what? Um, yeah. So I don't know. And it's probably, you know, denial too. They didn't want to know, but, yeah. um, they were pretty surprised. Oh, okay. So you came out and started dating your first guy. As soon as you did that, it was like, okay, yep, this is the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I used to say, and and I was dating guys and girls at the same time for about a year. Um, I had a girlfriend in Newport Beach who would come up to Santa Barbara and we would go out and get drunk and dance and come home and fuck. And, and then she would leave and then I would see the guy I was dating during the week. And so I was trying to, because I, I enjoyed having sex with women and I felt like that's what I was supposed to be doing. But what I started understanding is it feels good and I'm, I can definitely do it and I enjoy it, but there's no, um, there's no, this is going to sound so silly, but there's no like fire inside of my belly. There's the, 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 in, the intensity of what was happening when I was with a guy was so different than, than with a girl. With a girl, it was all about how it felt. And with a guy, there was just all this other stuff happening from it. Um, and it got to the point where I remember my girlfriend at the time, she used to say, why, how come you only fuck me on my hands and knees now? And I was like, so I can close my eyes and pretend you're a guy. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I quickly realized I needed to make a decision. So, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that sounds silly at all. I totally <laughs> mean, so, wow, that's, I don't know. It's just, it's always so crazy to me. Like, you know, just when you hear those types of stories from like your generation, I, I just, I don't know, it kind of bothers me how a lot of young people will be like, oh, you know, it's so hard to come out. I'm like, yeah, go talk to someone who's like 50 plus <laughs> then and tell me how hard you got it. But I start to realize though, that I think, cause I complain about a lot of stuff and then I hear myself and I start to laugh and I'm like, okay, we all have our realities and we base, you know, it's, it's like you're, you're basing the good and the bad based on what you know. Um, I definitely love the idea of being able to talk to guys about that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, I spend, I spend a lot of time with guys who are in their probably 20s and early 30s in my bed these days. And I'm just always baffled by how confident they are. Like, it doesn't matter what their hair looks like. It doesn't matter what their skin looks like. It doesn't matter what their body looks like. It doesn't matter how hairy they are and where or not. They're just like, I'm just a guy who's gay and I'm a hundred percent confident in myself. Like, like I grew up in an era where like I would spend an hour getting polished to leave the house and go outside. Like everything had to be perfect. Every hair in place you know, like powder on my face to make sure my skin tone was even like crazy stuff, even as a teenager. Like it was all about putting something together so that I could leave the house and present myself in a certain way. Um, so 
I get really envious when I see guys who just wake up and roll out of bed and go out in the world and live their lives. And I'm like, fuck, I wish that I, I wish I grew up with that kind of confidence. But for me, there was so much hiding and masks and manipulating scenarios so people wouldn't really know, you know, who I was or what I was about. So it was a lot of work. Damn, that's interesting. I never thought about it like that. But you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Because, damn. Because I, I the other thing I love to going through that. The other thing I love too, and it <clears throat> just fascinates me is <clears throat> I'm not like I'm not like a, a the best bottom in the world. Like if, if the connection's right and everything's right, I'm I'm I really enjoy it, but it's it's not it's not like my thing. And so when I'm in bed with a guy who's just like like cannot get enough of being fucked, and I'm looking at them, looking at their face, you know, I just I get so envious and like, sometimes I'll be like, fuck, I wish I liked that as much as you. I feel like I'm missing something. Like you're just so fucking on another planet. Right. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm fascinated by, uh, by younger guys. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. The thing I've always been envious about is when guys like their nipples are really sensitive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> someone rose my nipples, is like rubbing your elbow. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> Mine used to be like if my shirt brushed up against them, I would get hard. And uh, so I was always like, you know, concealing my dick all the time. Um, and then I had them pierced when I moved to Utah and they went completely dead. Yep. So then I took the piercings out about six, seven months later. And then they're, 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 they're not what they used to be, but they definitely like, I'll always tell guys like, if I'm on top of you and I'm not fucking you hard enough, just touch my nipples and I will fucking pound you into next week. <laughs> it's like an on and off switch for me. So, so has your sex drive gone down as you've gotten older or how like, yeah. um, it's funny. Sex for me has to be very scheduled because I'm so busy and I keep myself so busy. I'm, I'm just one of those type of people that always has to be like running at like, you know, high speed. Um, so it's like, sometimes it's hard to fit it in. So what I find for me is when I get to it, I'm, I'm all about it. Like I'm in 150% and I don't, I don't really, I don't really date a lot. I mean, I've tried it in the past and I've been with some really great guys. It just, it sort of isn't my, it's not really my comfort zone. I, I, I tend to do better and feel more grounded in my life when I'm single, but those two hour interactions with guys where I can like literally hold their face in my hands and have a total immersive boyfriend experience and like fall in love with them and have this really insanely connected, passionate, sexual, you know, and then talk afterward or make dinner for them or whatever. It's just this whole thing, but I only need it in little chunks. And then when it's over, I'm like, all right, see you. And then I just kind of shift back into my life. And then when I start feeling like I need that again, then I will, then I will like seek that out and have that experience again. So I don't, I don't know if that's forever for me, but I will tell you that porn was challenging for me. It was like, I mean, I was having sex like once or more than once, seven days a week because I was escorting, I was doing massage, I was shooting content, I was shooting for studios, I was doing photo shoots. Like it was just, it was my whole life and it was fucking exhausting. So, <laughs> so now when people are like, oh, I'm having a sex party or I'm like, oh, I can't, I still need a break. Like <laughs> I'm still, I'm still tapped out. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get that. I don't know. I. The reason why I ask is because when I was like 20s, 30s, like my sex drive was like insatiable, like nonstop. And then once it like hit 40, I don't know, it just goes like like three, four days, nothing. And then it'll peak like super high every yeah. day. And then it just so curious. Yeah, mine's more like mine's more like weeks in between these days. <laughs> but if I have to show up, I show up. Okay. So so. For those of the people watching who have never seen, like, your other interviews, like, I, if you want to talk briefly about, like, your, 
your job resume prior to porn because you don't have a typical like it's very impressive thanks um I, I i it's funny i got out of school um and was getting ready to go to law school and i changed my mind at the last minute and decided i was moving to hollywood to work in film and television and my parents like I, it nearly killed them and I put everything I had in storage and I came to LA and I slept on a girlfriend's floor for like three months and I found a job and I moved up the ranks really quickly in that PR agency. And I was managing um, like super high level celebrities like Nicole Kinman and Kim Basinger and Kathy Bates um, in a, in like, so when they, when, when, when celebrities do a film um, they do a, what they call a junket for the movie. So like they'll show up at like the four seasons in LA or something and every media outlet will fly in from all over the world and they have a whole day with the, with the talent. So my job was to move them through all the interviews and then at all the premieres, walk them down the carpets, introduce them to the outlets. So it was a really, really fun job for right out of school and with some really big names. I was always seeing myself on like E entertainment and stuff like that. And, uh, so I just got, I just got bit by that bug really quickly. And I, I never looked back at, at law school. Like I never even thought about it again. And it just, every time I got the hang of one job, I realized that it wasn't quite for me and I wanted something else. So I would, and this is so me, I would seek out people in that field and then I would hang out with them and like be part of their friend group and then I would start dropping hints that I wanted to do what they did and how I was impressed by them and I want to be like you and you know people's instinct pretty much when they're being flattered like that is to help so I just kept moving into different into different roles from like publicity for talent to publicity for features to television publicity then I took over fo all the photo responsibilities on set for all the TV shows at Disney. And then I moved into Fox and then I was a creative designer doing home entertainment packaging for 12 years. And when I left, I was their like exec creative director for all of the international home entertainment product they did. So, you know, it's, and then I got into beauty and now I'm, now I'm a creative director in the beauty space. So, um, but yeah, that was just sort of what I had done the whole, my whole career. Um, kind of falling from one opportunity to the next. It was pretty, it was pretty cool. And that a lot of those skills translated into porn, correct? Well, I think for me, I think everything I did was a skill I needed for the next thing. So like when I was in TV and I was producing these huge, like hundred thousand dollar photo shoots over a weekend for like a new TV show, on location with props and all the actors. I mean, I was in, Ken I had a horse racing show that took place in the late 1800s. And so we flew the entire cast to Kentucky and rented a huge estate on, uh, on, the, on the water, on a lake with a horse track. And we had horses and the whole cast was there and they were riding horses and we were doing horse race scenes. We were capturing it all on, on, on stills. So they were pretty epic, epic shoots. And I was the responsible for doing like the travel, for the talent, like the hotels, the craft service, booking everybody, hair, makeup, wardrobe. like So I got this production aspect. And I think that was what really set me up to be able to move into these larger creative director roles, managing teams and putting shoots together, still shoots and video shoots and infomercial shoots and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think each job sort of took everything I learned and sort of prepared me for the for the latest, for the latest one. So what got you into porn? Would you just wake up one day and you're like, Oh, I'm going to go shoot porn. Like how did walk me through that? I, um, I was, it was right at the, right at the start of the pandemic. And I had an Instagram feed that I paid no attention to. I had like 2000 followers and, uh, I, I grew it to about, I don't know, like mid 20,000 followers in about 90 days. And all I was doing was taking pictures of myself without clothes on. And it just like, and I would take, put like a post up every day and it just sort of started to snowball for me. The other thing I learned really quickly, and this is from my dad and probably from my career is no email, no message ever went unanswered. So my rule was if you're taking the time to send me a message, I owe you the time to get back to you. 
as it as I got bigger, sometimes they were just emojis, <laughs> but it was always something. It was very, very rare that I didn't respond to a message. So that interaction sort of just started to, I think, make people want to share me. And so um, just as that got to its peak, Instagram deleted me because they said I was um, posting inappropriate content for their fucking whatever they call it, their community. Yeah. And then, um, and then I got let go from my job because of COVID. So all of a sudden I have no hobby and no work. And some guy messaged me on Facebook messenger. And he said, I mean, verbatim, he was like, Hey, Mike, you don't know me, but I think you're an idiot. And I love your content on Instagram. You should be monetizing that set up a Twitter account. But at the time, I didn't follow porn. Porn for me was, oh, I want to beat off, you know, hot, hairy muscle, type it in, whack, turn it off. And that was it. I didn't know who anybody was. I didn't know porn was on Twitter. I didn't know there was a world where people promoted it. Like I knew nothing about it. Nothing. So of course I was like, why do you want me to join Twitter? Like you want to fucking talk to Donald Trump? Like what happens on Twitter? So uh, he sent me a bunch of links and I started studying like, oh, Drew Sebastian and, and all these different guys, right? You know, at the time Cole Connor was pretty new. So, but, but I was like, like Brian Bonds. Like I started to see these names and look at their profiles and how many followers they had. And I really started studying their feeds and then I understood what I, what I, if I wanted to do this, what I needed to do. And he said, and he was talking to me like every week, what have you learned? What do you think? What do you want to do? It was very cool. And he said, what's your name? And I said, oh, I said, it's Lance Charger. And he's like, oh, he goes, where did that come from? I said, that has been in my head since I was a kid, like in my twenties, because my first boyfriend was Lance and my high school mascot was the Chargers. And I was playing a drinking game in my like, mid 20s with some guys and they're like dude what's your porn name and of course i had no idea what they were talking about and they said it's your first boyfriend and your high school mascot and i was like oh that is so fucking good i'm hanging on to that so like literally 20 years later 25 years later i pull it out of the back of my brain and and there was lance and so i had a lot of footage that i filmed in my basement dungeon when i lived in utah with all these like you know mormon boys when i when i let my hair go gray and i sort of became the daddy of salt lake it was like the line right and it was all through facebook messenger like that's where they, all the guys found me to come over so i would put masks on them or keep their face out or put their back you know just their butt up and film content and stuff way before only fans and all that stuff <laughs> And uh, so when this started, he said, start your feed and just start putting, you've got, he goes, I know you've probably filmed yourself before, so put some content in. And I did, and one week later, I got two messages from studios. So it happened really, really quickly. So. Damn. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then it just sort of took off. I remember going over to a friend's house, um, uh, my friend Aaron, uh, he's um, RC and Digger, um, such, such great guys, old friends of mine. I love them so much. Um, but I, I went over there <laughs> and I had no idea they were doing porn until they popped up in my feed one day and I messaged them. I'm like, Hey, and, and Aaron was like, Oh, he was like, fuck, I knew this was you. He said, what are you doing? So I went over to film with them. And the first thing he said was, how long have you been doing this? I said, I don't know, four or five months. He goes, how is it? that everybody in this industry knows who Lance Charger is already. And I was just really flattered because Lance was a product for me. Like he, I, everything I had been doing all the years before in PR and marketing and creative production, like that's all the stuff I brought to building, to building Lance's presence. So, um, so yeah, that's how it, that's how it started. Okay, here's a question for you. I'm willing to bet you've never gotten before. So something that's always surprised me is the number of like female subscribers that I have. You know, mm -hmm. I just it blows my mind how many women watch gay porn. But I'm yeah. guessing that you had a shitload of female subscribers because you got like the daddy thing going to like a, a T. So funnily enough. 
I rarely ever got a message from a female, oh. but in my escorting business, I had a lot of husbands hire me to fuck their wives. That was the interesting, and they weren't, they wouldn't be there. And the thing was, they were grooming me to, to eventually have them join. And in a few cases, three, actually, I met the husband first and he was a client. And then he said, I want you to meet my wife. So then I would go to a hotel and hook up with the wife. And then the wife would share the news back. And then the goal was to try and bring me in so that the guy could sort of, and the guy always pretended they didn't know me. They were like, oh, I know your type. If we want to do this three-way thing, how about if you like connect with one of the guys? And they would pick me with like three other guys, knowing their wife would choose me. And then it would all be set up. And one of those times I showed up for a three-way and the wife was super impressed that he like got into it. And she, at the end, she was like, I just really appreciate how like into this you were for me. Cause I really wanted to do this. And I was thinking to the husband and I was like, oh yeah, he takes it all the time. <laughs> oh my God. You and I have very, very similar stories in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty fascinating. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I just, I could see, I personally know a lot of women who would like lose their shit for you. <laughs> They'd be like, oh my God, he's so fucking dreamy. <laughs> so one thing that I just, my humble opinion, I, I admire about you and I, I'm curious, like, you know, what you would say to uh, the people watching is like, especially in the gay community, a lot of gay men uh how do I want to say this? They they like fear aging and they start dyeing their hair jet black when it's clear that you know and they overdo the Botox and all that shit. So how did you just say fuck it? And do you see what I'm getting? Like what would you say to men who are struggling to embrace their age or the aging process and you know? I guess the first thing I would say is you kind of have to make the decisions in your own time. Like I dyed my hair, my beard, my chest, my pits, my pubes. I dyed everything for about 10 years, really dark brown. And my roots were white and my beard would get white along the line here with a dark beard. Um, it was, it was, it was a lot. I was, I was doing it every two days. It was a lot of work. Oh. And I was in Utah and I moved there with my partner and we had a personal and business venture fall apart all at the same time. So two years into my four years there, uh, we split up and he moved back to Los Angeles and I moved into a different house and, you know, was trying to continue my life there. Cause I didn't, I didn't really want to come back to LA and, uh, I just got, I mean, I was in Utah <clears throat> and so I just got tired of all the upkeep and I was kind of depressed from all that I had lost. I lost a lot of money. I lost a partner. I lost a business. I lost my home and had to move into a different place. Like I, I lost my dog because it was, you know, Peter took the dog. So I just sort of lost everything all at once. And then I lost my job. So I was just, and looking back on it, I'm actually kind of surprised at how well I handled all that. Um, for me, when things get really stressful, I try to turn everything into a funny anecdote. I think it helps me process. Um, but when I'm sharing stories with people, they think I'm like mentally unhinged because I'm laughing at something so serious. Um, but I just was tired. And so I was like, I'm not doing any of this anymore. So I cut my hair like military short, cut my beard almost off um, and just let everything kind of come back. And I, and I, I liked it. I was like, yeah, well, this is what I look like. I don't, it, I felt like it, I wore it. Okay. And, and I started posting pictures and then all of a sudden this whole new world cracked open for me and everybody was calling me daddy. And I just sort of leaned into that for a bit. So yeah, it was pretty, I mean, thank God, thank God it's the era of the daddy. And I'm not just aging in the world that I grew up in because I thought, I thought hairy guys, older guys, you know, guys who were vascular. Like I thought all that stuff was so gross. If someone had like a hair on their back or their shoulder, I was like, Ugh. like I was shaved and tan and I was a little Britney Spears twink. And so it was just like that whole 
whole other thing by bleach blonde hair. And um, I just wasn't into any of like the guy stuff at that time. I was, that's, that's what we were all into when we were in our twenties. So thank God it's not that way now. Cause I'd be sitting on my balcony in a rocking chair, drinking, drinking wine at night, wondering why I can't get laid. <laughs> so one thing I'm curious about is how did you get into bodybuilding? Like, it always fascinates me. Um, you know, it's funny. Cause I was, I was, I'm 5'10". High school, I'm 5'10", and I weighed 138 pounds. Now I weigh about, like, you know, 195, 196. So that's a big difference. It's a pretty big spread. Um, but I just, it wasn't until I, it, never in college, it wasn't until I moved to L.A. and I got into West Hollywood. And back then, there was a gym called the Athletic Club in West Hollywood. And it was where all the porn, no, I didn't know this at the time. But it's where all the porn guys, like, hung out. And I just remember, I, I... I developed such a horrible case of body dysmorphia and sort of self-hatred around how I looked because I felt like I was projecting this image of like frailty and femininity and faggotry and all the things people call me. And I realized, okay, here's another opportunity for me to, for me to change that perception. And that's why I started working out. Plus you walk down the street and everybody who walks by you looks like they're you know, out of a fucking Gold's Gym ad or something. Um, perfect bodies, like perfect looking guys. I mean, it was intimidating for sure. Um, so I think that's that was the catalyst for me to start working out. So, And what's kept you in it this entire time? Um, well, it's become such a habit for me that it's how I process stress and emotions. Um, but I also, not only do I feel good, but I like to look in the mirror and it, it's, it's, been, it's been a long journey for me to get here. And porn is really what shifted this for me. I like looking in the mirror after a workout and being like, I like what I see. Like, I'm glad I'm taking care of myself. I'm happy with the way my body looks. Like that's, that's important to me. And developing a healthy self image has been a, a lifelong journey for me. And I'm still not you know, there, but, uh, but I definitely have my moments now and I didn't used to. So, yeah, but it's part of, I'm still very image conscious. I mean, I work in beauty, so of course, like, um, but yeah, I do it because it makes me feel good and I like the results basically. Okay. Yeah. I don't think the body dysmorphia ever goes away ever. Yeah. Like ever, ever, ever. It's no fun. No, I mean, I'm 260 pounds, and when I look in the mirror, I still think I weigh 140. Isn't that crazy? And, like, it's funny because one of the things I've realized is over the years, there's, like, 15 guys who I still know, who I kind of grew up in the L.A. scene with, who when I was in my late 20s and early 30s, maybe even late thirties were like the sexiest, hottest, most phenomenal, unbelievably perfect men I had ever seen in my life. And they are all so bloated and huge and their faces are really round and they carry all this extra. Like I can tell that we're all plagued by this thing to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I am too, but my, even when I was doing steroids and trying to get big, I don't love to eat. Yeah, that's... And so the not really eating, it didn't matter how much stuff I was sticking in my thighs or my butt, you know, injections when I was doing steroids, I wasn't eating enough. So my body never really, like my friends would gain like 15 pounds and I'd gain like four. And as I'm looking back and seeing some of these guys, I'm actually, I feel like that was kind of a blessing because it kept me from getting like, hitting that tipping point where it just all of a sudden becomes mass. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I mean, I wanted, I was crying about it back then. Cause I was like, why can't I get big? And it was all I wanted to be. Um, but in retrospect, I'm, 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 I'm fine. So. So what made you finally leave porn? Uh, okay. Finally enough, I've done a lot of these interviews. 
And one part that I haven't really talked about, it, it's just so dark, but um, on the on the more strategic side, I got this job that I have now that was like literally the job I've been working for my whole career. And it just presented itself to me out of nowhere. And I tried to do both. But right as I was trying to do both, some of the studios, the big studios that would never had zero interest in me started calling. And I had a coffee table book. I had two films, two like feature films in Florida. I had a shoot in Chicago and I had two shoots here with like all the big names, like lead roles. Like it was everything just started happening at once. And I kept saying yes. And then I started looking at my schedule and I was going to have to miss about six, seven weeks of work during the summer last summer to maintain that. And so then I just made a very rash decision. I was on like June 30th. I think I was actually getting a, a manicure and I was like, I have to race home and retire tonight because it's the last day of June. And I started two years ago in June and me being obsessive compulsive, I wanted to have that perfect two year message. Thanks for the two years. And I felt like if I went into July, it wasn't that anymore. So I rushed home. I spent three hours finding the right photos and typing the right messages. And I sent messages to all the producers, all the directors, all my friends. I posted on all my media outlets. It was just like, all of a sudden, a few hours later, I was done. So, <clears throat> and that gave me the time to, and I mean, I put it down. Like there was no like, Ooh, I have to finish this scene or I have to, I have to film only fans. My massage thing came down. My escorting came down. I was like on that day, it all just stopped for me. Um, and I knew if I didn't do it that way and I kept little pieces, it's just not how I operate. Like it was like, I needed to, to make that commitment and walk away. One of the things that was happening behind the scenes for about probably a year, but the last six months of it were, were the worst is if you don't know this, there are an inordinate amount of people pretending to be me everywhere. I mean, scruff grinders, sniffies, only fans, like, uh, there's, there's guys who have full massage websites, like full reputable websites for their business, <clears throat> but it, they're Lance charger. It's all photos of me and what I never, and catfishing. And then I, I would, I started getting like 10 messages a day across all the platforms from guys saying, Hey, are you in Connecticut? Are you in Ohio? Are you in New York? And I'm like, and I, suddenly I realized I was like, no, man, I'm, I'm not. So be careful. Um, and I, and I spent a lot of time on the phone with like the highest levels of customer support and marketing executives at like scruff and grinder. And everybody said the same thing. There's nothing we can do. I even reached out to, to Google and said this site. And I sent them all the documentation, my photo, my driver's license on the site. And, and they said, we don't, we can't really police the internet. I even talked to GoDaddy because I knew the whole site was hosted through GoDaddy and I thought maybe they could help, but nobody did. So I thought, okay, I don't have a, I don't have, um, I don't have anything. I can't do anything here. So I just had to keep telling people, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. But I tried to answer every one of those messages where it started getting twisted is when guys, well, a lot of guys were giving money because the Lances were saying Venmo me $300 and I'm having this huge party, blah, blah, blah. And these guys would do it. And I never once ever judged anybody for making those decisions in the moment because I know what that's like. And, uh, so, you know, I just would try and counsel them in a way like, you know, please be careful. Like, and I kept saying, if we've interacted as much as you say we have, cause I couldn't remember, there was a lot of people that I talked to, then you, something in your gut should have told you this wasn't me. Um, so then it got to the point where guys were sending me, two guys sent me photos of themselves, literally bludgeoned because they showed up for a massage and they'd walk in the door and say, Hey, where's Lance? And the guy would say, I am Lance. And they're like, eh, no, you're not clearly. And I talk to him all the time and I know Lance. So like, where is he? And then the guy would have a full blow up and beat the shit out of them and take their wallets and their money and stuff like that. So 
when that stuff started happening and it happened a total of three times along with all the money that people were losing and the fact that I couldn't get anyone in the industry, like even the guys wouldn't talk about it in the business. Like I couldn't get any support. It was just something I didn't want to be a part of anymore. So, and, and I thought that if I left the business that maybe people would stop doing that and I would be able to sort of influence in a way that that wouldn't happen anymore because nobody would be interested in me anymore. Um, sadly enough, it's not the case. I mean, I haven't had anybody sending me photos of them beat up anymore. Um, I mean, one guy had like stitches in his head right here. It was, it was, it was frightening. And I felt terrible. I felt responsible. And uh, so, but I still get messages all the time. Are you in this town? Are you in this town? Oh, I just gave someone $300. And it turns out when I showed up, it was like an abandoned building. And I mean, I can't, I can't sort of protect everybody from those kinds of mistakes, but I just figured if I wasn't around anymore, um, maybe it would slow it down. Um, now that isn't the primary reason that I retired. Of course it was the other job, but um, it was, I just felt really helpless in that scenario. And I felt like people should want to help me and want to investigate and want to find these people and, and do something, reprimand them in some way. But you know, when you're talking to like a head marketing person at Grinder, and you give them screenshots of the guy's page, his feed, and screenshots of the conversations and the money exchange, and you give it to them and they say, Oh, we tried, but we can't find this person. And I'm like, you own the platform. Like there is no even well, they're not logged on right now. It doesn't matter. You like it was just so. I don't know. It was really, really upsetting for me. It's so. bullshit. Yeah. The, the and on the heels of everything I went through, getting banned from Twitter for breaking community guidelines, right when I hit a hundred thousand followers, like six months into my career in porn, that disappeared overnight in a minute, and they refused to speak to me. And when someone finally got back to me, they basically said, "Quit fucking messaging us." You're banned. There's nothing you can do to fix that. You're done. So like I had to buy an iPad. I had to create a fake account. I had to get a burner phone. Like I had to change my birthday. Like I literally had to become, a, which I'm good at at this point, I guess, become a completely different person so that I could get back on Twitter and start building up my following. And to this day, I still don't have, I'm still like at 98 or something. Like I still don't have a hundred. I haven't broke the hundred thousand that I hit in those first six months because you know, when you're new and that wildfire starts going, there's no stopping it. But when that stops to try and go back and get all those people to be interested in you again, by that point, I was fucking old news. So, Yeah, no, there's the fact that you couldn't get anyone else to speak up about that issue is mind blowing to me, but it also breaks my heart because I'll get messages all the time. Like, Oh, are you in South Africa? Are you in Australia? Are you in Florida? Like, no, dude. And, like, I never got any pictures of anyone beat up. But I've gotten messages like someone will text me, Oh, hey, are we still on for 2 o'clock today? I'm like, I, I don't know who you are. Oh, really? I sent a deposit to you over a grinder. I'm like, just. Yeah. So I guarantee there's other people experiencing that. Why oh, for sure. people don't want to talk about that is. I think I also tried to like rally people to boycott and walk away from OnlyFans at one point because they were taking away all of our content. I mean, even this morning, almost a year after retiring, I got a message from OnlyFans that they pulled five pieces of my content down. So like, it's still a revenue generating stream for me. It's shocking to me that people go there because a third of my content is on OnlyFans. Everything I ever did is on Just For Fans. Same price, but you get the entire library. But because OnlyFans has that high level brand recognition, right? They're like the Kleenex of content, you know, providers. Um, it, people keep going there. And also, Everywhere in my feeds and on Twitter, it says I'm retired. And I get so many messages from guys saying, I'm going to be in LA. Do you want to film? And I get a lot of messages on OnlyFans and just for fans asking me when I'm posting new content because it's been such a long time. 
I look, I'm thrilled that people are still subscribing. And one thing that I know about content is people don't, it's very rare that someone subscribes and stays forever. They're looking around and finding new people that they think are hot. They subscribe and, you know, I have 300 and something pieces of content. So there's a nice library there for people to watch. Um, and it's new to them. So it's great. And that's why I won't take the feeds down because it's like my whole history of content creation on just for fans. Um, but I get like 15, 20 new subscribers every month and only fans still now the same amount is dropping off. So it's kind of staying, keeping this even thing, but, um, yeah. And I've, I even sent a note to everyone in individual messages to everyone when I had like, I don't know, 900 subscribers and it was at the peak for me, I was sending everybody individual messages, telling them that I would give them a discount if they moved to just for fans. Cause I wanted only fans. Like I was done. And that whole bullshit debacle they did in the press about like, we're getting rid of adult content and all the stuff that was happening there. Um, but like, and I tried to get guys to do that. Like, let's just, if we stop working with them and we move everything somewhere else, we win. But nobody wanted to hear it because it ties, it taps into your revenue and your livelihood. So nobody was willing to lose. And I don't blame them what somewhere between 500 and eight thousand dollars a month of revenue with only fans or more was in some cases just to make a point so yeah no i think that's why people don't like jump on those bandwagons because they don't want to get involved they don't want to be the voice in case there's retaliation and they don't want to risk losing losing their livelihoods and i don't blame them for that so yeah, no, and, and that's one thing I will say. I've done like 50, 60 of these interviews. I would say 80% of the people I've talked to feel the exact same way that you do. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, even for me, for my content, my OnlyFans has like 170 less videos than everywhere else. Yeah. And it's the same price. It, it, it... I just don't think, <laughs> I don't think people read or pay attention these days no i'm i think we're we're very trained uh, and social media has done this and the phones have done this but more and more and more it's like i'm not a big reader which is why i'm so fucking glad i chose not to go to law school because i thought i was going to be in like gucci gucci suits every day in a in a courtroom performing like on tv and when I was trying to make the decision about law school or entertainment, I had a girlfriend of mine who was in law school be like, all you do is sit in a dark fucking closet and read briefs all day long and write dis like write notes. And, and, and it's, it's like, I've worked, I've been a lawyer for five years. I've never been inside of a courtroom. And I was like, Oh, it's not like TV. So, uh, so that was one of the reasons that I left because I was like, Ooh, I would have died in there. Cause I mean, like I eat at Denny's because there's pictures on the menu and I don't have to read what the food is. Like it's that bad when it comes to reading for me. So like, I understand the whole thing about s just skimming headlines and getting the, the smallest bits of information you can to create a story and weave a story and understanding together. Um, but like, I just think that's part of our problem is we just don't, we aren't paying attention. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> it's amazing how similar we are because when I was an undergrad, I was actually planning to go to law school too. And I came to the exact same conclusion that you did for the same reason. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go for my MBA instead. But uh, like, I'm curious based on your personal experience why you think this is. And just to be clear, this is not how I feel. I would never actually okay. do this. But I've always like joked with my friends. I'm like, I'm telling you, I could post a nude picture on Twitter and write the caption like, oh, God hates fags. I hate all of you burn in hell, blah, blah, blah. I could write the nastiest shit ever. And it would still get thousands of likes because no one would even fucking read the caption. Because only one's looking at only one's looking at is your fucking body. Like what I know. I did a lot of those tests. I did a lot of testing the integrity of the community when I first started, um, because I had this, um, <laughs> I had this misguided, uh, idea that I was going to 
turn the porn industry on its head because I was going to be like the nicest guy in porn. And I was, everyone was going to love me because I was so nice and I was professional. I showed up on time and it was like, I had this vision of being like the America sweetheart of the gay porn industry. And so I was doing, I started doing a couple live things on OnlyFans because I wanted people to get to know me. So I would say, send me a question that you want answered and I'll give you a free month. And my first live, and I mean, me being me with my experience, I promoted the shit out of it. I even paid five different guys who had like 240,000 followers on Twitter. And they just, you know, you pay them for posts to get like exposure and reach and awareness, like $500 one month to like all these different places to promote my live. Two people showed up. No one asked a question. No one tried to claim their thing because it was get to know the real Lance Charger. <laughs> and one guy sent me a note and was like, take your fucking clothes off, man, and beat your dick. So, you know, it was those kind of tests to see. And then, you know, my friends would be like, dude, this is porn. Like, like nobody gives a fuck about you. They just want to see you fuck. And so it took me a while to realize that, like, I needed to show up the way that my fans wanted me to show up for them because I wanted to like be everyone's friend and have them get to know me and have this whole like chat. And, uh, it just, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't the business I was in. And I had a hard time with that in the beginning, understanding that. <laughs> Dude, you, and now I look back and I think, wow, you're fucking stupid. You and I are so similar. It is unreal. <laughs> Cause I used to have that exact same thing. Like I, I still even do it to this day, but yeah, no, it definitely does erode your faith in humanity. But when, when you have reach, I, I'm, I'm for me personally, it sounds like you too, but I don't want to speak for you with that kind of reach, which, and plus I do want to make sure everyone understands I have spent my entire career working with celebrities. Like I never have thought of myself as a celebrity. I always cringed when I heard the word star. Like I work with people who have 13, 14, 15 million followers. So my little hundred thousand over here in Twitter, like that's why when I would be in rooms with some of these guys and hearing them talk, like, you know, talk shit about their fans and talk about like how high and mighty there are and their celebrity and, they get this and they get this. I would giggle because I'm like, I, I, like you have you, you know nothing. Like you know nothing. So, um, so I was always super humble about it because I knew what it really looked like in the world. And you know, what do they say? There's a percentage of people in the in the world who are gay, and then there's a percentage of people who are gay men who watch gay porn. And then you have an even smaller percentage of guys who watch gay porn who actually know who the porn stars are and follow the industry. It is a tiny, hair-thin sliver. So when people start getting all, like, you know, pumped up about their celebrity and how popular they are and start acting like dicks, I'm all, ugh, I can't. So, yeah, it was interesting. But, but what I was getting at is, you know, when you have reach, when I had reach, I wanted to do something with it. I wanted to try and make a difference and I kept getting reminded that what drives people in the porn industry is sex. And I mean, you know that, but I don't know. I thought I could, I thought I could do something differently and realize that it wasn't, it wasn't like that. So where I exercised that ability was in my, in my DMS with people, because I would get a lot of messages <clears throat> from people talking about how, <sighs> whether it was my age, <laughs> uh, how brave I was at my age to take my clothes off and fuck people in porn. Um, through the interviews I did, I had a lot of people saying like, you've really helped me with some of the sexual issues I had talking about body dysmorphia. Like I do think it touched people along the way. And I felt, I felt good about that, but um, not on the scale I had hoped to, but again, I kept having to remind myself, this is porn. This is porn. Like, People want to watch you fuck. People are looking at it to get off and have sex. And I had a, um, a studio owner, um, uh, LeGrand Wolf, um, who I worked with a lot. He was such a great mentor. He hired me a lot. I loved flying back there and working with him. All of his content was so fun. 
I mean, I can't say enough great things about Carnal Media. They were phenomenal. Um, and I don't usually plug people ever in interviews, so that's new for me. Um, but the thing about him is he kept reminding me, because I think he could see my struggle sometimes. <laughs> he kept reminding me, all you have to do is make them come. If you do that, you win. And it was such a basic sort of mm -hmm. reminder for me. But when I was out spinning out and like I wanted to change the world and be a, you know, a do-gooder and stand up for people's rights and, uh, and it wasn't working for me and I wasn't connecting with my fans in that way, uh, he would just remind me of that and it would kind of bring me back down to, to one. So I like that. So who are you as a person like outside of work outside of the marketing outside of porn like what do you enjoy what do you do for fun i'm still i'm still figuring that out i have to be honest with you i have spent my life <clears throat> i've spent my life identifying myself solely through work so there's like you know my friends are funny the ones who stick around because they know that I'll pop up at a very odd time. They'll be somewhere and see me and they're like, oh, and then three months will go by and nobody sees me. Um, and and a lot of people take that, taking that personally over the years. Like I don't like them or I don't want to spend time with them, but I give so much to work. And then I have me and the gym and meal prep and shopping and sleeping and I talk to my parents every single day. We're extremely close. They're truly my best friends in the world. Um, so there's not a lot of time for like seeing people and going to bars and doing stuff like that. So it's not really been a priority for me. But every once in a while, someone will call me like, you know, I'll have a guy who wants to hook up and it'll, we'll be chatting for like a year. And this was a good example. Last night, he messaged me yesterday and was like, Hey, I know I'm always asking you to hook up and just thought I'd check in again. And I said, yeah, come over at seven. Like it just, it was the right moment in time for me. And that's sort of how it is for me. So I, I don't, I don't really have any hobbies. I mean, I'm going to sound, everyone's going to think I'm such a pathetic person here, but I'm the work I'm doing right now is realizing that I am a creative person who approaches the world and situations from a creative lens and is always looking to sort of find something creative and interesting and beautiful and aspirational to try and connect with people. And my jobs have always been a wonderful vehicle for that, especially in beauty, because I'm all about helping women solve issues that they're having with self-confidence, right? Their skin, their lines, aging. How do these products worked, used correctly, give them the promise of solving their problems so they then have this incredible self-confidence and they step out into the world and they act and live differently? Like that's, I live for that. I love that stuff. So the, the thing is, I'm still trying to figure out I need a vehicle in my personal life to exercise all of that. So it's not always the job because that's going to free me up to have more time to spend with my friends and have a life outside of work. And it's, I'm 53, like it's time to fucking figure it out. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, and it's funny because the timing with that question, I'm just starting to scratch the surface of this right now in my life. So. I, don't know. I mean, I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel like even when you were doing porn, you were wanting to do good almost to counterbalance the porn. Would I be correct in that? Well, okay. So I never really had any shame about what I was doing in porn. Like it, I never equated it with something naughty or something I shouldn't be doing. So so I don't think I had a counterbalance of wanting to do good as a reaction to doing porn. I think it was just, I was trying to find a way to do what I love, connecting with people and building them up and connecting to their emotions and creating aspirational things, you know, just what we just talked about through porn. But I realized porn just wasn't the vehicle for that. So when my job wasn't the vehicle for me to reach and do that and reach people. I didn't 
I didn't know what to do because I didn't have an outlet in my personal life to exercise all of those, you know, all of those creative instincts. And actually I've never, ever been able, I've never put that into words the way I just did right now. Like I just figured something out right here, which is kind of fascinating. So that's awesome. I, I, Thanks for the therapy. <laughs> I just been like counterbalance to like, cause in porn, a lot of times you can feel like an object or, you know, or counterbalance to like some of the negative sides and all that stuff like that. I didn't have that experience. I didn't, it didn't matter. Like feeling like an object is how I felt my whole life because I've put myself out there in a way that was very presentational. So I created looks, personalities, scenarios to get people to give me attention, compassion. You know, my life, I've always, and I'm learning as I get older, I was trained at a very young age through society and my experiences to know that the only way I can get attention, affection, respect, admiration is to earn it. It doesn't, it isn't just, for me, I don't think it just naturally exists. And that's why I work so hard the way that I do. Um, so yeah, I, I, I never, I, of course I felt like an object because I, I, I created Lance as an object. Like it was the whole point of my marketing plan. So there wasn't a negative connotation to that because I was succeeding. So I think that's a really healthy way to look at it. Yeah. He, I mean, I built a bio like before I started, I had a one page bio in the beginning. I used to read it every night before I went to bed and he was the total antithesis of me. He was like, you know, he played football in high school. He was like fucking fucking girls and fucking guys under the bleachers. And he was super confident and he was really hot. And you know, the way he spoke and the way he carried himself. And I mean, I had this whole person that I built. Um, Cause I never saw myself that way. I never saw myself as like, masculine like a sexy male object of like masculinity virility like those things were things i hadn't i had i wasn't connected to so creating lance and living as lance and being in the scenarios it's really helped me embrace some of that and bring it into my personal life so there was a lot of interesting growth and healing for me in porn too and i talk about it a lot i mean it, we talked it, it was the main quote that world of wonder pulled out when they were doing the trailer for click boys was, you know, it, and it was such a, it was such a bad, I felt like it was such a bad representation because it was the only clip you saw in the beginning. And it was me saying porn did for me what 20 years and $10,000 worth of therapy couldn't do. And it's, it's true, but it sounded a little corny, but it was, um, it was a great experience. Like I have zero regrets. I mean, I'm a, I'm a different and better person now because of those two years for sure. So you had mentioned like you've been able to do something that not many people have done. And that's like monetize your content after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. I had, um, uh, uh, dragon media reached out to me, um, just as I was sort of leaning into retirement. Um, and we made a deal to license my only fans content. Um, so they could then distribute it, uh, like DVD and VOD and EOD and, you know, and, and, and make some money on it. And so I had to sit down and say, okay, this is the amount of money they're offering me per scene, but I need to, I have to, I of course had to get permission from every single model I was in, was in the, and some of these, <laughs> some of these young guys were like, oh, like, oh no, I need like eight times that amount of money. And I was like, okay, so so let me share something with you. Like this used to crack me up. I'm like, we have a scene that we filmed together. I paid like hundreds of dollars to have my videographer Norbert shoot it, light it, edit it, color correct it, split it into trailers, split it into parts. You didn't have to pay for any of that. Cause that's how Lance rolled on everything he did. So it was free. I gave you your pieces. We both had them running on our feeds. Now I'm telling you, I'm going to give you X amount of hundreds of dollars. You can keep the scene. You can keep it in all of your things. Like you never have to take it down from OnlyFans. You can still monetize it. But now I want to give you this much money so that I can sell it to someone to have international, basically like DVD rights. 
And they were like, no, no, that's not enough money for that. And I said, so, so I'm like, you do know that no one else is ever going to come to you and ask you for this. And if they do, you then have to go through me to get my permission to sell the scene. It was so short-sighted and so funny. Um, but most of the guys were like, fuck yeah, I'll do it. So I sold about 20 scenes. Um, and so that stuff is still being released as new compilations, like Lance Charger compilations, even now, almost a year later. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was just a smart business move for me. And I think people think that it's worth like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for someone to license your content. I'm like, it's 45 minutes of fucking that we did for free. Like, what do you want? And I know that the people licensed it are probably making 20 times as much money off my content as they paid me. But I'm like, I'm done. Like, it's just sitting there. Like, I don't care. I'll take the money. So, yeah, it was, it's, it, was, uh, it, was, it was awesome. I was so, um, I don't know, the word flattered sounds so gay. Um, but I was really, really flattered that somebody was, like, wanting to, to, to take that much of my content and license it and, and remarket me. So oh, that's, I'm curious. So like it, what your thoughts are, what do you, why do you think this younger generation struggles with that so much? Cause I agree a thousand percent with everything you just said, like with everything, I'm always thinking long-term I'm not thinking, mm -hmm. you know, now I'm thinking, but this young generation, it's like they see right here. Yeah. They're, like short sighted is we've we've created a negative connotation around that, but the this these younger generations they live in the moment, and that's a amazing 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 way to live your life. I live my life in the past and in the future, and I miss a lot of what happens now. These guys are right here all the time now. Does it make them seem short-sighted and shallow and selfish and basically stupid sometimes? Yes, because you have to be able to balance the long game. But not everybody does that. And and I'm just as short-sighted and, and, and stupid as anyone because I don't enjoy the moments that I'm in often because I'm too busy ruminating over the past or trying to plan to be strategic for the future. So, um, so I think it's a, I think it's a balance, Yeah. but I, I do admire them for being able to be grounded, like in their, in their moments. It's, um, it's not easy to do. So, so what does the, the future look like for you? Cause it sounds like you're really happy with what you're doing now. Yeah. Um, um, I, am. uh, I don't know. I mean, only once in my career have I had a job that was a really long-term job, 12 years at Fox. And they were like the best 12 years. Like we were family. I loved having the, 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 the stability of the same job. And I had many different roles throughout that time, but it was nice to feel like I had a home base. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can build something like that at this company. I've been with them for a year now and I would love to, see what happens over the next four or five years and be a part of that and see the company and the brand change and grow and, you know, give me more and more opportunities to like reach out to customers and women. And I just, it's, it's, I love my work so much. Um, you know, and some people would say schlocking beauty products really isn't that like, you know, uh, isn't that, I don't even know the word I'm looking for. Like we're not, you know, we're not designing rockets or doing brain surgery, but it means a lot to me and connecting with people means a lot to me and offering them uh, hope and opportunities for, for more confidence and to feel better about themselves. Like I really, I really get into that. So this is a good vehicle for that. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I'd love to kind of hang out for the next four or five years and really see what happens here and grow that. And beyond that, I'm not, I'm not really thinking that long term right now. So I'm trying to, some of my work right now is staying present. Okay. Do you ever see so. yourself getting married? <laughs> you know, it's funny with my ex, Peter, um, we were, 
we lived in Utah and we were going to open, working to open a, a business for him. And he knew an editor of a magazine, like the main magazine in, in Salt Lake. And I said, um, one night I said, if we open this business and it's as successful as I think it's going to be, I'll marry you if you get us on the cover of that magazine and do a spread of our wedding. So again, it was very tactical for me, right? It was a, it was a means to something. Am I interested in getting married for the sake of getting married? I don't even like guys to spend the night. So I don't know if I'm cut out for that. <laughs> so, no. yeah, it's just, I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't live and breathe in that relationship space. I love the connections, but I'm a short burst kind of guy. I mean, even when I played sports, like if I had to run around the track, I was last. If I had to do a hundred meter anything, I, I won every blue ribbon. So. I don't know. I was just curious if, you know, your age impacted that. Cause. I, it's funny. Cause people say when you get like, do you want to be old and die alone? And I will say, I think the reason I'm so secure on my own and have everything I need is because of my folks. If when one day when they're not in the picture anymore, I don't, I don't know what I'll turn into. Like I have so much love and fun and companionship and mutual respect. I mean, they are truly my absolute best friends. I talk to them every day. I see them once a month. Like I just can't get enough of them. They're so fucking crazy and fun. Um, that, you know, maybe that's part of the reason that I'm so set up to be so independent because I have, I'm so grounded and I have all those, those things that I need. So. And one last question on the relationship front. Uh, this is, I'm just curious because I, I understand being very goal and like career focused and all that stuff. Do you feel like part of your, the reason you feel that way is because how do I want to say this? Because a lot of the times a relationship can feel like a distraction, like it's diverting your attention. Do you feel like if you met someone who is more of a partner and you guys were working towards something together, that, that would change things? <laughs> I get asked this a lot. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I guess what I'd say is, and I haven't met that person yet, but part of that is what I bring to the relationship. I'm a, I'm a major caretaker. So I want to always make sure like in my work, right. It's always about how can I be of service to you? Now I'm a selfish, selfish son of a bitch. And I definitely get everything I need to get out of my life. And I put myself first and take care of myself, but I, I definitely sacrifice a lot of what I want in a relationship to make sure that the other person is feeling safe and secure and loved and taken care of. And I love to buy people things. Cause remember I have to earn people's affection. So a really great way to do that is money. Um, so there's just a lot of, there's a lot of fucked up shit in my head that I'm still sort of navigating and, you know, pulling threads and seeing things open up. And so I don't know. I mean, it's probably just about timing. Like I told you the guy who texted me yesterday, I'm like, sure. Come over after a year and a half. Right. So maybe there's going to be this day when I've worked on my stuff and there's this opening and someone steps into the opening and it, it all works out. Yeah. So I'm not opposed to it. I don't say it's never going to happen. I just say right now, that's not, that's not who I am. So, okay. so just to be clear for, cause a lot of porn stars watch these episodes you do not shoot any content at all anymore. No. Even when I'm just fucking around with guys and they want to film, I'm like, eh, can we not? So, yeah. Sometimes, like, I'll get a, I'll get messages from people who are like, oh, I'm, I'm just starting an OnlyFans. It would be so amazing if you would do, like, a cameo with me to help me get my, my, my 
you know, my, my page up and get some exposure. And, you know, there's always part of me because that's the hero in me, right? It's like, yes, let me show up and be the guy who like puts you on the map. And, and then I have to check myself. Cause I'm like, remember bitch, like you don't have that kind of fucking power. So stop going into that whole celebrity. I, I'm like some big shit thing. But then I also remember like, it's not who I am and what I want to do anymore. So being sort of true to my decision to retire and, and so, but, but I always want to jump in and help and save the day. So it, it definitely, it, it trips me up a little bit sometimes. Okay. So usually I give people an opportunity to plug stuff. Like, even though you're retired, if someone's watching this and they're like, Oh my God, like, this guy's so fucking hot. I got to go subscribe to his content. Like you said, you're retired, but it's new for them. Where would they find all your stuff? I mean, honestly, it's Lance Charger. Uh, so on OnlyFans, it's Lance Charger. Just for fans, it's Lance Charger. I mean, it's usually just my name um, because it's pretty unique. Um, I would definitely recommend that if you're subscribing and wanting to see my content, Just for Fans is probably a better bet for you because instead of 100 videos for $8 a month, you'll get like 350 or something like that. Speaking in general terms, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a more valuable subscription. Um, but that's, that's kind of it. I mean, I'm active on Twitter still, but I don't communicate with people in real time. I just retweet anything, any of my content that other people are posting and any mentions I'm in, I go through the mentions like every through two or three days. And I, and I like any comment anyone says that if something, you know, is engaging to me, sometimes I'll reply, but I don't really post there. Um, like the only post I would probably do in Twitter is to promote what we're doing here. So, but I don't actively post there. So, no. so basically it's just my, my only fans are just for fans. Okay. I mean, they have a channel on raw fuck club too, but it's, it's, it's also a, a smaller scale than, than just for fans. So no, no, I just, I, I always, Love hearing the perspective from, you know, the older generation. And I just, I don't know, like when I was looking through your bio, I'm just like, what in the world have you not done? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. I mean, I, I'm, I, I look back at the hard numbers of studio films and scenes, content, photo shoots, award nominations, like in a 24, literally a 24 month period, uh, I'm, I'm really proud of that resume. So, and, and you haven't had any negative ramifications from that at all. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. I mean, I think now I've been out of it long enough and I've been in this job long enough that, that, that hopefully if it did come up, um, but again, this is a reminder of how niche gay porn is so you know i believe that the only way something like that would manifest if if someone was upset with me and purposely set out to expose me and that does scare me um but i've had such a wonderful relationship with all of my fans and all the people i've encountered in the industry during the time i was working um, I didn't really have a lot of negative, you know, there's a few times I blocked people cause they were like, Ooh, you're so disgusting. You're so old, like give it up. And that kind of stuff. I was like, I respect your opinion and yes, you get to say what you think, but I don't, I don't actually need to hear that. Um, but I never, uh, you know, I had one guy who was a good friend of mine who went after me for something. And I feel like it was a misunderstanding on, on, on his part, but he went to a blog and they wrote like a really nasty piece about me. And it was a pretty major blog in the gay porn industry. And, uh, and I had two people that were really doing a lot of support on Twitter, send me notes and say, because I just read that article and that's who you really are. We're done with you. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to refute the information because one, I figured everyone who knew me knew that I would never, ever be that person. And I was confident in that. Two, 
to refute the information would have meant I would have had to call my friend who basically just betrayed me, but I would have to call my friend a liar. And I just, I wasn't willing to do that. Um, whether, cause I didn't understand the trauma or the circumstances behind why he said what he said. And without that knowledge, I didn't want to accuse him of something in a public forum. Plus I don't hash things out in public forums. I never have. It's just not, I'm a really good communicator and I think I manage people really well and I communicate really effectively, but it's not something that I like go out and publicly broadcast. I just, I've never understood what motivates people to do that. Um, so yeah, so I just kind of stepped away from it. And, and honestly, three days later, it was gone and I just moved on. So, yeah, no, I, I think that, I think that that's something that younger people have taken to that. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. I've never agreed with the whole publicly outing and bashing people. And it's just like, yeah, no, or even just airing your own laundry in a public forum like yeah. oh today i just found out i have cancer or today i just found out like today i found out my best friend is fucking my boyfriend and fuck this and fuck, like this whole just like living my life on a stage like look i i love being on stage like i love being performative i love being in like the center of attention but it's all very crafted for me like these interviews are pretty fucking honest but it's not like like I know how to show up and be what I need to be when the cameras are rolling or when I'm in a certain situation. Um, I honed those skills very early doing publicity for actors and actresses. Like you start to understand what the audience needs from you and be that. And again, that ties back to me feeling like I need to show up as who and what other people need me to be so I can get that respect and love that I feel like I deserve but i feel like the only way to get it is to earn it it's so it's so super tricky fucked up shit so you'll eventually figure it out the older we get the more we just put the puzzle pieces together well it's gonna have to happen soon <laughs> i told you i'm 53 <laughs> it's not like i'm 35 like i'm figuring my life out <laughs> yeah but 50 is like 40 so you know it is it is and i do you know, I do, I do love when, when people ask how old I am and I tell them and they're like, shut up. So like, that's a, that's a compliment for me for sure. But um, yeah, people love to lead with the age thing. Like I can't tell you how many guys I've been in bed with or talking to and they've said, and they've said, how old are you anyways, daddy? And I'll be like, oh, I'm 50, whatever. And they're like, oh fuck, I hope I look like you when I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> or I hope I look as good as you when I'm your age. And I, it's just, it's always like, like, thank you so much with like a hint of cut, right? Old? <laughs> Who uses the term old? Older, yes, but old. Right. I've had a few uh, 20-somethings be like, you know, God, I want to look like you when I'm that old. So, <laughs> but I, 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 I brush myself off and, yeah no, so. they're young and god yeah honestly when i was that age like i told you somebody in their 40s even i was like ugh, fucking troll <laughs> so i'm so blessed and so thankful every day that this whole daddy thing exists because i get to fucking have sex in my 50s like i don't have everybody like shunning me for being an old fart like i did to older guys when i was younger like so, I'm just thankful social media didn't exist when you were younger. I would have been canceled a hundred times over. Oh, I don't I don't know if I'd still be on the planet. <laughs> I think it probably would have drove me to suicide. I had some really dark, fucked up years when I was younger. And if social media was exacerbating it in like a global forum, I don't think I would have survived it, honestly. Yeah, no, I, that's one thing I, I always thought about. Cause like I used to get bullied a lot in school growing up, but at least as soon as you left school, it ended. Yeah. Right. Until the next day. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I used to carry that anger home and then my dad would show up like at four from work. Cause he would leave for work at like four in the morning 
and I'd hear the garage door open and I was, it was my time to process all the horrors of the day. So when he would interrupt my time, I was the meanest, nastiest. I mean, I'm, su- I'm surprised he didn't like send me away to boarding school or something. I was a whole, I was horrible to him. It got to the point where he used to sit, finish work and go sit at a restaurant down the street from the house for two hours and not come home. Cause I was such a fucking tyrant, tyrannical bitch to him because I needed my time to process. And so like, it was like, they were just rough years. So yeah, no. And imagine seeing social media during that. No, like I said, I don't think I would have, I don't think I would have lived through it. So yeah, no, fuck. I just, I, yeah, no, I, I seriously, I cannot thank you enough for doing this. I, I just, you've been on my, like, <laughs> I like want to interview list for, for quite a while. And I just, I, I feel like one of the biggest things is you just, you disprove so many like porn star stereotypes or, you know, people think, Oh, he just got into porn cause he can't do anything else. Or it's like, with you. I, I, I will say, I'd love to answer that too, or speak to that in the two years I worked, There wasn't a single set that I showed up on where there were drugs. I never worked with anybody who came to work strung out. The guys were always, almost always, so professional. They knew their lines. They took what they did really seriously. It's a a really great community of really great guys. Like, I just... And I don't, I don't know that some of these guys even would want people to know that they're really great guys because, you know, a lot of the people I worked with, there's no difference between their porn persona and their, and their active life persona. Like for me, they were very separate. Um, I do love that I can pull on Lance and bring him into the bedroom um, these days because he's super fucking fun in bed and I was never that fun. So it's like nice to blend that together. But like these guys are great. Like I loved working with them. They're smart. Um, uh, I never encountered like rampant drug use. Um, I don't know. I think that I appreciate when people say that I dispel the myths, but I think a lot of these guys dispel the myths too. I really do. It was, it's a great community full of really great guys, talented, professional. Um, it's, it's, it's not what, what the stereotypes think it is across the board. Now that exists all throughout it in pockets, just like in society, but it was never my experience. So, yeah, no, I, I just think that, I don't know. I'm wondering where the hell the stereotypes even came from. Well, I mean, things don't just come out of nothing. So I'm sure that, um, I mean, there's a ton of content on the internet right now, slamming videos and like P and P videos. And, um, it's a, it's a, it's a fetish and a niche within the business, just like it's a fetish and a niche in people's lives. Right. Um, so, you know, and you know, some guys will want to show up to set and they'll do a dose of G because they, you know, it makes them calm down or they'll smoke a hit of pot or, or whatever it is. I just never saw it. Um, but yeah, I'm sure it exists in pockets and in small doses, um, uh, throughout any business. Um, but like I said, I, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure that's, that's where rumors like that are born, but remember this too, when someone doesn't understand something or they think it's taboo, they reconcile it by destroying it decimating it, canceling it, creating horror stories about it because they, it's people who are against legalizing sex workers and people who have stand up on a platform about porn or being gay or trans or drag or whatever it is. The main emotion behind all of those actions is fear every single time. These people are seeing something they don't understand. It's triggering something in them and it's threatening something, whether it's their belief in their faith or their belief in their community and how they would be judged. And then they find someone, and I wish everyone in this country was lucky enough to have a friend who was 
trans or gay or a drag queen or whatever so that they could understand it from a human personal perspective because when you get that kind of connection and understanding and you realize there's nothing to be afraid of you're all of a sudden armed with knowledge to go out and take risks with other communities and spread that message so it's like those NBC things that were on all the time when I was a kid that would say the more you know, right? It's like, if you can just understand something, I mean, as a musician, they would put a piece of music in front of me. And I, I didn't, I didn't know it. So I wasn't perfect at it. And I would go home and I'd throw my violin case down and throw the music and my mom would be like, what's the matter? I'm like, oh, I hate this fucking, fucking music they gave us today. It's fucking bullshit. Wah, wah, wah. And then I would practice for like a week and then I would go in and be like the star because I would like, I had it down. And then it was my favorite piece of music, right? It's just how humans are. So. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. A lot of the times people hate a group or hate whatever because they don't have any experience with that. And then, you know, when they meet someone who's like that, especially someone who they didn't think was like that, then they're like, Oh shit, actually. The other big thing is that I find in, in most cases in my experience, so I'm speaking in my experience only here, but the people who react the most violently, the most negative, the most outspoken, it's because whatever they're speaking out against has triggered something in them and it's triggered a bunch of shame because they identify with it on some level. I'm not saying that every homophobe is a homosexual inside, right? I would, that's, that's just way too broad and too general. But if something's going to make you have that visceral of a reaction, it's tapping into something inside of you. And, and I, I look at that a lot in my own life. Like, you know, one of my, one of my, one of my things right now in my life is to expand the, the window between the stimuli and how I react to it. Because if I can just stick my fingers in there and open that up a little bit wider, um, the reaction, it either doesn't happen because it's not important or it's very, very non-emotional and very constructive. So, um, but you know, we don't live amongst a lot of enlightened beings these days. So. That is so, so, so true. So true. I don't know. Eventually we'll get there. Eventually we'll evolve. And (laughs) I like to think so to maintain my own mental sanity and my own belief in humanity. I, have to believe that it's possible i have a little part of me a little fatalistic part of me that looks up at the sky sometimes and says hey whoever you are this experiment it's gone completely fucking wrong like you need to fix it like we are not we are not okay (laughs) so uh yeah i don't know i think it's you know it's it's a, it's an interesting time, is what I'll say. Oh yeah, but I don't know. I I like to believe we'll eventually get there. You know, it's like uh, Chris Rock or I can't remember if it was Chris Rock or Dave Chappelle. He made a joke once. He's like, "Whatever the fuck you hate, it's gonna end up in your family." Like if you oh, if, I love if that. you hate Puerto Ricans, your daughter's coming home with Ricky Martin. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> So, I don't know, I'd I like to think that, that eventually, but no, seriously though, I, I, I can't thank you enough for like taking the time to do this, your insight, your story, your everything, I, I just, yeah, don't know. Thank you for having me, and you know, it's funny because I wasn't sure when we first talked because I feel like, especially after the World of Wonder documentary on Click Boys, I just feel like it's it's... I started feeling a little overexposed, meaning that I was telling the same story over and over. And today we covered so many things I've never talked about. And I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful to you for asking different questions and for guiding me through this interview in that way, because, um, I think a lot of the stories we talked about today are really important. Um, so anyways, I appreciate, I appreciate that. 
and uh, and thank you for the platform and the and the time. Uh, you know, almost a year after retirement, I'm flattered that people are still interested in um, in hearing from me. So thank you. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think your your impact will stick around for for quite a while, and I just well, we'll every see. time I look at you. I just, I know so many women who would just look at me like, oh my God, please tell me he's single and he wants to get married. That's, uh, that's, that's flattering. Thank you. So, but for those of you watching, thank you so much for uh, sticking around with us this long. And, uh, yeah, this is a long one. Yeah. Oh, geez. Wow. Okay. Hey, guys. Just wanted to say thank you for watching this video. And if you did really enjoy it, I just wanted to mention there are two ways that you can help to support this channel. On the right side, there are three little dots. If you click those, there is a super thanks button. And on the left-hand side, there is a join button where you can join this channel. There are three different tiers of memberships. The top tier does actually allow one-on-one -on -one messaging with me via Discord. And I personally answer that it is not a service. That's just, you know, both of those are ways that you can help support me as a content creator in this channel. I mention this because YouTube is by far the thing that I enjoy doing the most. It's the thing I'm most passionate about. And unfortunately, a lot of the sexual videos the porn star confessions, the dom sub, all that stuff. It is not monetized due to the nature of the videos. But either way, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I hope you guys all have an absolutely amazing week. I love you all.